Our top focus, India's upcoming AI Impact Summit can potentially shift the global dialogue on artificial intelligence. New Delhi can position itself as a voice for the global south, advocate for AI that is inclusive, affordable and aligned with regional needs. At the G20 summit in November, Prime Minister Modi called for a global compact on AI to prevent its misuse and ensure it's transparent and safe and also possibly starting a real conversation on AI governance without stifling innovation. As nations race to integrate AI into their economies, India summit in February could set a new tone for international cooperation in artificial intelligence. Prioritizing human-centric applications over just technological competition, how can India really achieve that? To discuss this at length, we're now joined uh, by two very special guests and this is part of our special series in collaboration with Center for Strategic and International Studies. Let me introduce to you Anjali Kaur, who is the former Deputy Assistant Administrator at USAID and CSIS Senior Associate. We also have with us Alpan Ravel, who is a Chief Scientist at Wadhwani AI. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Anjali, if I could uh, really begin with you right now. In the context of the Global South and the needs of emerging economies, what is the opportunity for India to deliver at the upcoming India AI Action Summit? Thanks so much, Parikshit. It's really great to be here, and it's great to be able to talk about why AI is so critical right now and why India matters and why this summit is so important as we speak. Remember, this is the first summit that's happening in the Global South, which is so critical. Previous summits have always happened with the Global North being featured, whether it be in France, in the UK, in Korea. And so that's why it's really critical right now that the summit is happening forward looking towards impact and not just thinking about regulation. And it's really thinking about what happens with the global south, the largest population that will be impacted by AI. And what makes India so important right now isn't just its size, it's the complexity of its population and the constraints that it operates under, 22 official languages, massive income diversity, low cost devices, patchy connectivity. And this is the lived reality of most of the global south. And so because India has been able to build digital public infrastructure at a level that no other developing country has achieved, whether it's UPI or DigiLocker or Adhar, these systems weren't designed for abundance. They were really designed for the real conditions most countries face. And that's why India's AI journey and the summit truly matters, because when India builds AI models, they're really thinking about practical solutions developed under constraint. And that's exactly what makes them relevant for Nairobi, for Dhaka, for Manila and beyond. And so when we talk about India representing the global south, it's not symbolic. India is truly demonstrating what inclusive, affordable population scale AI can actually look like. And that flips the traditional story. And for the first time, the global north is learning from the global south on how to scale technology responsibly. And this is why the summit is so consequential. It's a chance to define right. what good AI looks like for the majority of humanity, not just the countries with the most compute. And India, I believe, is uniquely positioned to lead that conversation. Okay, let me also get an Alpan at this point. Alpan, when it comes to the unique lessons from the India stack, our uh, experience from delivering services to citizens using artificial intelligence, what are some of the solutions that India can offer via the India AI Action Summit to the Global South? So India, um, India is very unique in what it can offer. It's a representative country for the Global South. Uh, we have probably the world's most diverse data sets even if they're siloed, we still have them. We have some of the largest data sets in the world because of our, uh, our population as the largest country in the world. And uh, we have a set of challenges and aspirations uh, that reflect the aspirations and challenges of the global south. And so I think that any, probably any challenge in the world is represented in some microcosm of India. In terms of specific solutions, uh, we have a lot of work that we've done uh, in public health, in agriculture, in primary education, where we can leverage data, we can leverage insights from data uh, and develop AI. And this is, these are all solutions that we've, uh, we've developed here in-house. And these are examples for the world. 
And we should really think of AI in the Indian context, in the Global South context, as a human enabler rather than as something that is uh, an automation engine, right? So we, uh, the whole responsible AI debate, for example, takes a very different color in the Indian context. Mm -hmm. And I think the book on responsible AI is yet to be written uh, for this context. Right. Now, when it comes to the use of artificial intelligence in the global south. And there is, of course, always a question, Anjali, about how much aid can you give to economies in the region. Now, there is a race between India and China. China wants to be the regional dominant partner. Uh, it has given billions in dollars uh, to aid to many of the economies in India's neighborhood. Can India replace that with initiatives in artificial intelligence? Can uh, AI initiatives really, you know, do away with the need of giving development assistance and replace that? I think that's a really great question. And, you know, having spent my career doing development work, there's a lot of problems that we see with development. Sometimes it's too slow or it's too risk, you know, averse, or often it's too connect, you know, disconnected from actual innovation ecosystems. And what we're seeing is that AI partnerships between governments, tech companies, civil society, they move a lot faster. They iterate better. They're less bureaucratic. So I understand why people think that AI may, might actually replace traditional aid, but, and I think this is really important, it can't actually replace the accountability and equity mandates that good development assistants have. And so at least they shouldn't be doing that. So what worries me is that tech partnerships can be extractive. They can prioritize commercial interest over community needs, and they can move fast and break things, right? But when you're breaking things like in public health or in education systems, people actually get affected. They get hurt by it. So I believe that AI shouldn't actually be replacing traditional development assistance. What they should be doing is exposing its failures and figuring out what's working and what's not working. And the future isn't development assistance or AI. It's taking the speed and innovation of AI partnerships and marrying them with the equity lens and the long-term commitment that good development actors actually bring. And so I believe, you know, the idea isn't who naturally funds it. It's the question is, are marginalized communities better off? Are local institutions strengthened or weakened? Is this sustainable beyond a pilot? And so if AI partnerships can answer yes to all of those questions, and some can, then we're evolving development assistance, not replacing it. And we have to be really intentional about doing that. All right. Uh, let me also get in Alpan once again. Alpan, when it comes to the global compact around AI, something that the prime minister has spoken about, can the AI Action Summit really deliver that? Do you think uh, both the developed and the developing world will come to a consensus? And without some sort of compact and regulatory framework that we agree upon voluntarily, can AI really help uh, global good? No, I agree that we do need a regulatory framework that we align with. It can't be a framework that's imposed from the West. It has to take into, into account the reality of Indian lived existence on the ground. Right? It has to take into account privacy concerns that exist in India that may be very different from the types of privacy concerns that exist in the West. And for example, you are looking at a population um, that is perhaps not so reticent about sharing their other numbers, but have serious concerns about uh, strangers touching their babies, for example, right? So that's a very type of uh, privacy angle that we need to consider. Um, discussions around bias and fairness in the Indian context also tend to be different from the Western context. So I think, yes, a global, contact, a, a global compact is possible, but it has to take into account local lived experience in India. And I think uh, once, once we take into account the concerns of the West, the concerns of the global South, and marry them into a single regulatory framework, I think that is what will spur uh, innovation and sharing of innovation between the global South and the global North. Right. Uh, Anjali, returning to you, what do you think success will look like for India at the AI Action Summit? And 
what can India do in terms of increasing investments in the global south on artificial intelligence to make sure that we're able to take our digital initiatives to other nations which really need them. We are bringing them solutions on ground that help their people in day-to-day -day lives. Yeah, I, I think that success isn't just India hosting this really important conference right now. It's really about India shifting the global conversation from the global south as a market for AI to the global South as a model maker for inclusive AI governance. And as Alpen had said, you know, we really truly need a, a framework for AI governance that's actually usable between the global North and the global South. And what that means is actionable guidance that a minister in Kenya or Vietnam can take back and implement. And we need practical playbooks. How do you regulate AI with limited technical capacity? How do you build these multilingual data sets? How do you ensure AI procurement doesn't just benefit big tech? And I really believe that India can lead this because it solved a lot of these problems already. And then next, we need to have these concrete partnerships. We need funded initiatives with clear deliverables and timelines. So imagine things like regional AI compute sharing agreements so smaller countries aren't you know, necessarily only dependent on big tech cloud services or multilingual data sets that are collaborative where countries pool resources, south to south technology transfer where India's AI solutions and agriculture get adapted for sub Saharan Africa, for instance. And that's truly what I see success looking like. But I also think it's really important for, you know, countries to be able to coordinate and learn from each other. Success is really peer to peer collaboration, not replicating the north to south dynamic with the different geography. And so I really see that, you know, be, being able to see the future of this is being able to make sure that resources aren't wasted and communities aren't harmed and trust isn't broken. And AI is going to transform development whether we're ready or not. And the question is whether that transformation is equitable, whether it's distributed, whether it's you know co-created rather than imposed. And I really believe that this AI summit hosted by India can show the world that the global South isn't just adopting AI, it's shaping how AI should work for the majority of humanity. And for me, that would be success. Right, and Alpan, my final question to you would be, there are many AI models that uh, countries and companies around the world are working on, but what will really be successful in the India context that we can scale up for the world? Uh, what will allow us to get more investments from US, from Europe into our AI infrastructure to scale it up, which is uh, commercially viable, uh, profitable, and also helps people around the world? Yeah, that's a great question. So I, I don't think, again, as I've, you know, as I keep on saying, I don't think we should replicate what's happening in the global north. I think we have unique things to offer. We have large platforms where we can integrate AI, and examples are, for example, the Nikshay platform for TB, there's Potion Tracker, uh, eSanjeevani. These are large health platforms, for example, that are consuming data, um, that are outputting data, and where AI is ready to be integrated. Right, uh, So we can develop AI models that are integrable into these platforms. Uh, we can develop models that are small, that fit on edge devices so that you have equity. You don't need these models to be used only in places where there's internet connections. You can, uh, you can use them in small villages. So this whole sort of small AI space is something that we can uh, dominate and we can, uh, uh, we, can develop and we can develop lessons for the world. Um, these will be models that benefit uh, rural India. These will be bon uh, models that benefit the urban poor. And these are sort of very viable uh, pathways for commercialization. All right, Alpan Rabal and uh, Anjali, thank you so much for joining us on the program with those sharp insights on uh, what India can do in terms of bringing AI solutions to the global south. And all eyes now on the India AI Action Summit. We're taking a short break, but don't go anywhere. We get you some more global news on the other side.